This is episode three of Emergency Hearts Dispatches. This episode, I was grateful to speak to Kevin Carnes, who is a legendary drummer, musician, artist, and activist. Kevin is in the group Consolidated, the surreal jazz group Brown Fellinis, and was involved in the Afro-industrial scene in the Bay Area and beyond. In this episode, Kevin discussed music and power, George Clinton, Consolidated, the Brown Fellinis, and jazz. Thank you to Awareness for the music, and here's the interview. What were some transformational moments that woke you up from the status quo of propaganda in the U.S.? Wow. Well, I could say meeting Adam, Adam Sherburn was one that was very profound at the age of 19. I was, I was a scholarship athlete going to school and very unhappy with that situation. And a friend at the university, I went to New Mexico State University, as did Adam, but he was gone when I went there. But a guy on the swim team put us in contact and Adam was looking for a drummer and I was looking for a way out of kind of being a sheep in the herd, you know, of like going to school because everyone told me to go, go to school. And I had a talent, you know, for, for, for track and field. And that kind of, that got me a scholarship, got me out of the house, got me out of Michigan, which were, you know, kind of necessary things and landed me in a band with Adam called the usuals. Prior to that, I kind of, I guess, you know, my, my musical experiences were always kind of very broad and politics and social sort of, uh, the social fabric, particularly of America and in particular expressed by black folks in music were things I was very much aware of, but wasn't necessarily pursuing them as an artist, you know, as a musician. And I started playing in that band with Adam and it was totally the opposite. You know, they, they were just all about addressing uh, what was going on currently with everybody, not just within this country, but, you know, just on a more global kind of plane from a, you know, a, just a broader perspective. And that band was one white guy being Adam myself and one Mexican guy, Oscar Medina, who was also gay, you know, and that put me into the world of punk rock and, and, you know, kind of post punk and disco of the day. This is, I'm talking 1983 into 84 that we were playing together and, and it just started tying together a lot of things in terms of what folks were saying musically and stylistically. You know, I was already in the Prince who was kind of blurring the lines of punk and funk and soul music and and parliament. And then at the same time, you know, finding out about, you know, some of the bands like the English Beat and Steel Pulse and and the Sex Pistols and Bad Brains and on and on and on. You know, just again, a lot of stuff of that time period stuff that was a bit more alternative stuff that wasn't on the middle of the dial or the big end of the dial on, on, you know, on broadcast radio. And, you know, that time period for me was very profound. It was a huge awakening to how I could participate. And I was, I was in need of that. I was in need of those alternatives. I was in need of those, that blurring of the lines of style, that the blurring of the lines of, culture and separation that I was kind of existing in before that in a in in an in a world where you were kind of you're either black or you were white, you know, and you either hung out over here with these people or you hung out over here with these people. And I, you know, because I was an athlete doing sports and also, you know, a musician playing in a marching band and all that crap, I kind of always existed in this margin, you know, between those places that I was always crossing over to both. And, and then further, you know, those divisions of you're either in the rock and roll or, or, you know, this kind of rock and roll or that kind of rock and roll or this kind of, you know, soul music or that kind of, you know, it's funk. And, you know, it was just music to me. HR from Bad Brains on one of their last records, you know, he says, music is music. And, and that's how I've tried to exist you know, and, and that's how I try and exist with people. And that's how I try to walk through this life, you know, is this like, it's all very basic on one level and we can make it as complicated as we want. At the end of the day, we're just 
simple human beings trying to relate to one another and get along. And, you know, that time period was, was very profound and, and helped to shape pretty much all the music or at least the stuff that's been of value to me, the stuff that was important since then. Two other sort of major projects that I became involved in. One of, you know, I've been doing for a little over 30 years now. And it's been about that. It's been about, you know, pulling back the covers on on what what people are afraid to look at or talk about or, you know, address sometimes in our society. I feel like, it, especially from those experiences, you know, those early experiences and some later ones that we can talk about too, it's been my responsibility. It's a thing that I can do for society as a performer, as an artist, as a musician, as a person who gets a platform that a lot of other people don't get, you know, being the stage in front of a bunch of people in a bar or a gallery or a concert hall or, you know, stadium or wherever, you know, not everybody gets that opportunity. So I feel like when I get it, I have to own it and I have to take advantage of that space and that time and the people that are in front of me, you know, to share something that is, is hopefully not just like some trivial bullshit that, that they're going to forget about, you know, the next day or whatever. Yeah. I love that. Well, it sounds like when you met Adam and a lot of things came together and a lot of walls were being broken down that had been built up previously. And then, yeah, you, it sounds like when you get on stage, that's one of your goals too, is to break down some of all these these barriers and walls that get put up by these different factors, like whatever they be, capitalism, white supremacy, just mass media, all that stuff. It gets smashed down by the art that you make. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's it's a great opportunity because one that a lot of people can feel safe in, you know, because it's music and it's performance and you're in this concentrated sort of environment and you can kind of come and go if you need to. And so, you know, it's not like, you know, if, if, if I approach some person on the bus who's different from me and I sit down and I just start launching in about race, you know, that's, <laughs> it's a little <laughs> risky for both of us, you know, whereas in the context of a song, telling a story in the context of a performance venue where we've all kind of agreed we're going to be coming into this place to do this thing. There's, there's, there's a kind of safety in that. And there, that safety then potentially lets a person feel a little more open to receive information, to receive feelings, emotions, and, and be stimulated, you know, and to be around other people who, are also being, you know, are also receptive to that and able to take that energy and that information and do something with it, hopefully, or at least consider it, consider something that maybe they hadn't considered before, you know, walking around as a black man in this country and other countries, because it's happened in other countries too. Sometimes I'm the scariest person on the street, but when I'm in a club, you know, on a stage, there's a whole different thing. There's a whole different expectation that people who don't necessarily look like me and some who do have just because of that environment. So again, you know, it's a, it's a place where I feel it's necessary to kind of take advantage of that and share something different with people than, you know, the stereotypes and the preconceived notions that they have about me and about us. And, you know, and the various us's as well, you know, because it's the same for women. It's the same for gay people. It's the same for, you know, Asian people. It's the same for anybody who gets otherized in this society, you know. Yeah. And so the opportunity to do some of those things and and support one another and 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 show a different side is is, you know, that's a huge thing to me. Thank you. Thanks for sharing that. Your, your music is always really mind expanding and it sounds like you always were really focusing your music on delivering like a message and a knowledge but funk at the same time i was wondering uh was this like a formidable experience like when you saw you talked about this isaac hayes and prince show that you saw in detroit and then you also would talk about the madhouse album by prince a lot too were these like formidable experiences that all kind of coalesced when you met adam and all that 
Yeah, very much so. Because, you know, again, like, you know, that early print stuff and, and along with that, you know, there's the, the P funk stuff parliament around that time and a little bit before some of the funkadelic stuff, but more so the parliament stuff for me where George Clinton and the other vocalists, it, things that they were saying, again, addressing the sort of social fabric of this country, hearing some of those same things coming from bands like Black Flag, you know, and 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 that scene. And then hearing some of those very same things coming from bands in the UK and from other parts of the world, you know, and later on, a few years later, you know, hearing some of those same bits of commentary, you know, coming from South Africa and that music and coming from, from Fela Kuti, you know, from Nigeria. And, you know, there's um, Duck Rock, you know, that record by Malcolm McLaren. So, you know, Malcolm McLaren, the manager of the Sex Pistols, put this record out in 1982 called Duck Rock. And it was maybe kind of the first sort of world beat record that I ever really kind of heard in, in a context. And on that record, there's hip hop, there's there's South African music, there's Orisha music, there's Orisha music played by Ann Dudley from a uh, Art of Noise and Thomas Dolby playing like they're playing like the vocal melodies on synthesizers while you know these bata players are playing the traditional stuff underneath and and it's constant for me I think you know there's there's newer things too stuff more recent there's a band I was just listening to on my drive last night back from Chicago for Hero do you know that group no, they're, I need to check them out. Four they're hero? kind of yeah. They're it's it's four hero. The number four, and they are I think are maybe a duo or 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 a quartet of musicians out of England, and it's very electronic and dance music. But at the same time, there's strings all over the place. But you know, Ursula Rucker, who is yeah. a spoken word artist, and several other people, they're just talking about stuff. They're talking about stuff in England. They're talking about stuff that's that's global and and human and i just feel that again that's our duty that's part of the duty there's there's also a need to be frivolous and get drunk and shake your booty and forget about your troubles too i think that that's equally valid you know i i i love rave music and and going and doing my thing and get my groove on and you know i think that's necessary too so I'm not trying to discount. I'm not trying to say that all music should have some kind of key hardcore message that is supposed to move the people. You know, I think that turns people off sometimes. You know, we can beat them over the head with information and they just simply stop listening. Then you're not you're not succeeding at what you're trying to do. You know, that's the other side. And I think that's why, you know, bands like Consolidated and a lot of other bands that I really like you can you can infuse the booty shaking with the head nod you know and and accomplish you can get in people's bones that way i think that's why a lot of music is in common time in the in the first place because we're comfortable with that it's part of our nature yeah definitely i think kind of like fella kuri had said that music is the weapon of the future and that really even just the artists if they're if that's what they're about it comes out in those frequencies too not always with words and things get transmitted absolutely it's also the food you know it's the delivery system for for a lot of stuff you know it's the meditation i i challenge people all the time to name a religious spiritual practice that doesn't involve music and I still haven't run across one. I, there may be some, but they all have some sort of musical sonic component to them. You know, it's either chanting, you know, I mean, even the Amish a while ago, I asked this question to a Facebook group and someone was like Amish. And then two days later, I had an Amish songbook that someone gave me ever present. You know, it's everywhere. Music and sound are everywhere and all the time. And one way or another, if people can tap into that, you know, it becomes a weapon. It becomes the food. It becomes the way that that we can communicate and relate to one another beyond some other forms that that are a little bit more linear. Yeah, thank you. And you were talking about Parliament. I was wondering if you could 
if you could talk about some of your recording sessions with George Clinton. One in particular, I, I, I learned more about dynamics and my own playing from that guy, from George Clinton in particular, in, in one recording session than in, in any other moment in my life. And this was about maybe, oh God, about 15 years ago, he needed some drums, a drum machine track he wanted to replace with live drums. I went down to Hyde Street Studios and uh, got set up and he played the track for me. And it was just, you know, it was like uh, like Gary Scheider playing guitar and Lige Curry playing bass. And it's just like a real cool, simple, funky track that, that they had done to a drum machine. So we got all set up. And in most situations that I had experienced up until then and since as well, the drum machine track would have been playing along. But in this case, when we started playing, the drum track disappeared. So I stopped him. I stopped the engineer. I was like, yo, I can't hear the drum machine. And he's like, oh, okay. So they re <laughs> rewound the tape and same thing happened again. I was like, uh, the drum machine disappears when I start playing. And they're like, yeah. I was like, kind of puzzled. No click track, no nothing. It's just the bass and the guitar. And they finally realized that I did not understand what they were talking about, you know, and they were like, OK, so you're just going to be playing along to the bass and the guitar. I was like, OK, cool. So we started and I was playing along. And what we figured out was that, you know, they were playing to the drum machine, but not necessarily all the time in the same place. You know, it's not like both of them were playing this way. Sometimes the bass was ahead. Sometimes guitar was ahead. And I had to figure out, and George also with me, we figured out like throughout this track how they were flowing. That was one thing. So, you know, like we might like overdub four bars and then stop and listen to a section and then overdub eight bars or overdub. And then, you know, he was just periodically like coming over the, the, the talk back and was like, okay, you got to play that snare same way every time. You know, cool. Boom. I just, you know, hadn't had that kind of experience where I needed to be that consistent, you know, and just not familiar with that kind of playing where, you know, when you're doing a studio recording, you know, you need that sort of solid kind of thing playing live and playing more my own style of music where that stuff is a little looser, you know, it's okay, but you know, he wanted, he wanted something that was more locked down. And so it was like really cool to have someone articulate that stuff to me in those moments where, you know, I'm sitting there concentrating on, you know, now I got to roll with the guitar part, but I can't forget my snare has to be consistent and I can't push with the hi-hat of this, that, and the other. It was, it was a really cool experience. I came away a much better drummer and much better musician from that two or three hour session that I did with him. And then there have been a bunch of others where, you know, it was after, after a P funk show and they would just roll to whatever studio and just go in and there'd be two or three rooms going. And <laughs> in one room, Michael clip Payne would be in there programming something and someone would be rapping over it. And in another room, you know, there was a whole other thing going on. It might be putting overdubs on something they did somewhere else in Denver, wherever they had been. And in another room, they'd be tracking drums and bass and guitar for something. And those are really cool experiences, too. And, you know, I'd leave out of there at eight o'clock in the morning and go home or go eat breakfast or something. And they were quite profound. It's just cool to be around musicians that create at such a high level. And after doing a two or three hour show as well, you know, and they would be heading right to the studio to to work as soon as they could sign a few autographs and talk to a few friends and bounce. And it just articulated a, a, a kind of work ethic that I could really appreciate and hearing those stories about Prince as well and and Frank Zappa as well and I'm sure a lot of other musicians but to be in it is a whole other experience yeah they, yeah because they're at that level so they're always just they're just tapped in all the time that's really awesome to hear yeah it was that it was very cool it was a very I'm I'm very that was a blessing 
all that, all that getting to hang and play with them, playing live with them. And that rolled me into some shows with D, uh, Lady Miss Keir from D Light as well. I was in her backing band when she was coming to the West Coast for out for a hot minute. You know, they they worked with her on on that first D Light record. Yeah. So, you know, that nice. that took me into some cool places and and I had some really cool interactions with folks as a result of hanging with them. Yeah. Thank you for sharing those stories. Right on. Uh, the next part I wanted to go into was when when you and Adam went over went to the Bay Area and when kind of you all started forming Consolidated or when you started working with Consolidated and kind of that whole scene. So when we moved to to California in the summer of 84, shortly thereafter, uh, I left left the band. We changed the name from the usuals to Metro Sensuous. And then we moved to California. I was uh, not mature enough to navigate some of our relationship issues and stuff. Typical shit that breaks up bands when you <laughs> are young. So I moved on. Adam started a band called Until December, and I started a band called The Beaten Eggs. And, you know, we, we at a point, consolidated and The Beaten Eggs shared a space. But... Before Consolidated, Adam had a really cool band called uh, Until December. And a few years into that, they disbanded and he started Consolidated. And I've always, you know, kind of, I've been a fan of Adam's as much as a bandmate and, and friend. You know, I've been a fan of what and how that guy says things. And, and he's a tremendous musician. And so... You know, when he formed that band, I was like really, really excited about it. And it wasn't until much later that I actually played with Consolidated at all. And the first time I played with Consolidated was actually just Adam and I uh, as a duet. We went and did a bit of touring in Europe and had done a bit of recording that wasn't directly intended for Consolidated, but ended up getting used as 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 Consolidated stuff. Then cut to I don't know, 20 something years later, they invited me to, you know, come and do some shows with them. And that led to doing some recordings, which happened last summer. You know, that gets it gets back to, you know, one thing it gets back to kind of what I feel is necessary. Consolidated has always been about addressing issues, addressing what's going on in this country and, and around the world. And and so I, 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 and I feel, you know, another thing that I feel and support and am a fan of is, is the fact that those guys have chosen to address some things from, from the perspective of, of white males that I feel it's, it was like I said, if you start beating people over the head with information, they shut down. And if we're going to talk about race, some people can sit down and talk about race and, and it's all good, you know, and like you and I, a white male and a black male sit down and talk about these things. Right. And some people have trouble with that, you know, and some people have heard over and over and over and over and over again, you know, we talk about slavery and we're talking about 400 years and we talk about reparations and we talk about affirmative action and we talk about this, that and the other constantly. Right. And that's all you hear from Chuck D and Prince and George Clinton and everybody, Marvin Gaye, what's going on. And, you know, and for some people, it's hard, understandably, understandably. Right. So. For three white males to get up and talk about race in this country, for three white males to talk about gender, to talk about issues with women, to support those issues. I don't know if you know about their work with the yeasty girls, for instance, mm -hmm. you know, and it comes off different. It comes off different when, you know, you're a white guy and you go to a show and, you know, their, their open format thing where they would have dialogue, that stuff was brilliant. You know, because maybe there is confrontation and, you know, some people just couldn't handle it. But there are a bunch of other white people in that room who heard what was being said and had to consider it, you know, and that was very, very powerful. That was beautiful. That, you know, is necessary again. And it's it's another way. And so I'm 
a big fan of of what those guys did and continue to do and so when they asked me to be a part of it i was like hell yeah you know and because 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 i can get behind that and so that was you know that being in the now with it and again having the opportunity to kind of address what's going on now from a different perspective is is it's a great opportunity for me and one that i love sharing with people because because like i said you know some folks need to hear about some of those issues from folks that look like them yeah you and know, especially with don't, gender and patriarchy yeah. and bringing those things up which yeah adam does so well yeah and so you know, and so few people do it and even fewer people do it well. So, you know, there's that part of it as well. It's just like, yeah, again, you know, it's like I'm I'm cool with people partying a little bit, but somewhere in your day, you got to stop and think about some shit. You know, <laughs> just <Yeah>. really, please. <laughs> I love that. Uh, so uh, staying on the topic of consolidated, I was wondering, is, is this when you started doing a uh, head bolt? Can you explain what Headbolt is and then also your your um, process for recording with Consolidated? How do you do that? Headbolt sort of it came about actually many years ago. And, and it just, you know, a lot of people that know me and know me for a long time know that I've worked under many names, uh, different monikers. Uh, and for me, part of it, it, it just puts me in a headspace. It's a headspace. Uh, I work with a band called Brown Fellinis and at a period where I used to spend a lot of my time smoking weed and progr programming beats, uh, one of my bandmates started calling me professor. And from there, well, just, just from there, I became the professor Boris Karnaz and just a play on words and a play on a headspace. And so Headbolt was yet another one of those that, when I sit down to create, it, it, it sort of dictates a mindset and that helps the music. It helps me sort of concentrate the idea because I can have way too many ideas super easy, like in a second. I've never been a person to have writer's block. I've never had writer's block in my life, knock on everything. But it's, it, you know, it, it, that's kind of the reason for it. And it came out of a time where I, I used to work at a, Audi Volkswagen repair shop. I was a parts manager there and shuttle driver. And I was listening to one of my bosses talking about ordering some parts. And he referred to a head bolt. And I asked him, what's that? Because there's just one, it sounded immediately sounded cool to me. But then he explained what it was and what it did. And so that was the, you know, the other thing for me that made it stick was that, you know, it's this crucial there's bolts that hold the head down onto the rest of the motor. And if those strip out or anything, you can basically destroy the motor very quickly. It was cool. Kind of like this, this like very kind of simple thing that was super crucial, you know, to, to this much bigger thing. And then the idea of, of a bolt of lightning, striking you in the head <laughs> so you know it 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 again is a place for me as an artist to kind of direct the 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 energy and the messages that i want to create within that and sort of separate myself as kevin carnes the drummer that so many people know me as and kind of have different worlds to reside in you know, I think about people like Square Pusher, for instance, like such an awesome, awesome name for what that guy does and is, you know. And I mean, I don't have any clue as to what his actual name is, but I know he's a fine bass player. And but but his production and and, you know, that stuff kind of come out of the, the that name to me. I feel like he probably may feel a similar sort of thing, though I've never heard him say so, that I do about, you know, just being in a headspace, you know, to to direct your your creativity. And then the process of of doing the consolidated stuff, I think I remember how they did some of their other other earlier works. This came more out of us getting together for a few days and just kind of jamming and then mining that that those sessions last year in the 
kind of late spring, I went back to California and Adam came down from, from Oregon uh, to Mark Pistol's place. And we just set up shop and recorded for five days, like five to eight hour days. We ended up with a ton of material. Adam had some ideas. I brought in some loops that I've you know, been playing around with. Mark had a few things as well. And then some of it is just free playing. And then we've gone back and sampled bits or picked segments, you know, seven minutes from day three, you know, at hour number four, you know, and grabbing things and then making stuff out of it. Some of it, like I said, was, you know, one person with an idea and, you know, the rest of us adding to it. And then we coming back home, you know, I came back with a hard drive full of stuff. Adam, Adam, I would say, has primarily been curating and sort of, you know, issuing a starting point for something. It's like, let's work on this and, uh, and then let's work on this. And so, as you know, we've been trying to release something every month since October or something like that. And it's been really cool because, again, you know, I can come from having played drums and hung out and done this stuff and then kind of step into my head bolt mode and kind of be like, what do I hear here? You know, what's there from, from that perspective to make something, knowing that Adam is going to make something completely different and Mark is going to make something completely different. And then we have two or three things that we're going to submit. And it's just, it's, it's been a really cool experience for me, both kind of having a steep learning curve with production. I've always been kind of a drummer or, or a band member and, and producer and then turning it over to someone else to mix and, and finish. And I'm still kind of doing that. Like I'm sending my mixes to Mark and he's polishing them off as much as we care to at this point, you know, there's going to be a time where I think where we come back to revisit all this material and make something a little more definitive and shape it into a record, you know? And so there'll be a bit more polishing of the stones to, you know, arrive at that. But as far as getting these kind of rough sketches out, it's, it's a really cool process for me, both creative creatively and as a person just trying to wrap his head around his little studio and all his gear. <laughs> nice. Thanks for talking about that, that whole process. And uh, yeah, I've been enjoying all the tracks and can't wait to see what else comes next. So uh, now I want to go back to uh, 1988. And, and this is with when you were probably all seeing each other at the studio sessions, like seeing Pistol, Mark Pistol. And uh, you were in the group. Uh, I'm referred to the group as the Beatins. And this was the early formings of like Afro industrial music. I was wondering if you could talk about this album and, and the, you, there's so much information on this. So you have samples from Malcolm X talking about South Africa, apartheid, like all the knowledge that it's almost like a master's class on race, on the reclassification control. Talk about all this. Yeah. Oh. Here. I love that track. <laughs> and you all know, talking about the CIA, like this, there's like, like a whole graduate degree of knowledge in this album. Can you talk about putting this album together in just that time? One thing I, I have to say is words, people give words power or take that power away. And that's kind of our intention with naming that band, the beat nigs. It was a play on the beat Nick movement, which for us also included people like the last poets so that loops around to some of the influence and how we were putting out information. But so, and then there's a play on, you know, which, which terrified a lot of people uh, of, of beating, of people being beaten. I don't personally use the word nigger. I understand people that, you know, use it as a term of endearment, you know, in the hood and, but they don't use it or pronounce it that way. It's a different thing. It's what you mean when you use any word. If somebody says bro to me in a certain tone of voice, it's just like using that word. It's just like using any other word. And, and so I'm not opposed to anybody using the word. I'm opposed to how you use it. If you refer to me and, and, and like, I don't like being called Kev. I like being called Kevin. You know, some people call me some other things, Kevy and, and, you know, 
I just don't really like being called Kev, you know, but I also, you know, there's ways that you can say Kevin that are going to, you know, let me know you it's tone of voice, right? My wife calls me Kevin from across the room and she shouts it like, come in here and handle something that you forgot to handle. I know. Cause it's a tone of voice, you know, it's not the word. It's the way she says it. Yeah, she wants intention. me to, if she wants me to rub her feet, you know, and, and she puts on that little demure kind of girly thing, you know, it, it's a different thing. It's the same word. <laughs> right. And so I just, I, I just want to address that because, because I feel like we are very sensitive to things and I appreciate your sensitivity, but I feel like we've gotten so tight, so uptight and so tense and so over responsive to words that we're not getting into the feelings, the feelings that we have to share with one another. You know, I appreciate I appreciate a lot of people's efforts to address things, but I also feel like we're, 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 we're wasting a lot of energy, you know, dodging emotions and not really getting to the meat and potatoes of our existence together. Yeah. I appreciate you bringing that up. Yeah. And then how that relates to, I mean, that, 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 that's something I've been carrying and, and processing since then we formed that band in 85 And you're talking about 88. And so we were well on our way with, with kind of how we were feeling and wanting to say things. But a lot of that stuff came out of all of us uh, kind of experiencing. I remember when I bought the last poets record, I was, I was DJing back then, which is kind of how we formed that band. We, I was DJing at a little club and I started kind of hosting a salon of performance art and poetry and so on. Uh, it was on a Sunday night. So I wasn't just like spinning records for, you know, bridge and tunnel folks trying to sell booze on a Friday night. I could be a little bit more creative. And so I went down to rough trade records and I saw this record. I had no idea what it was. It said the last poets and I bought it and I had heard a couple of the tracks in particular niggers are scared of revolution prior to that. And then um, that poem is in a film about the Rolling Stones, about the making of uh, Sympathy for the Devil, which I saw around that time. Someone gave me a copy of Malcolm X's autobiography around that time. We, you know, that was the period of time where people were talking about black consciousness. You know, it was in hip hop. And, and, and so young people were, were, it was, it was part of the everyday for, for, you know, some folks. And so we were having those conversations and, um, and again, it was in the music, you know, I was listening to bands like Steel Pulse and Bad Brains and Linton Kwesi Johnson, you know, all this reggae music and dub music and some of the, uh, ska music that was coming out of the UK and it was already in the P-Funk too, you know, and, and I'm a huge Richard Pryor fan. Uh, I, I know all them records. I grew up with all them records. And, you know, Bicentennial Nigger was, that was 76, you know. And so a lot of that information we felt was necessary for people to know about, you know. And again, to put it into the storytelling and the performance in a context where people could receive it and not have to get it from PBS news hour or read about it in the New York times, or, you know, having that fire and brimstone of some lecturer, you know, give it, let's put it in a song and give it to you that way. And let's pay respect to some of these people like Malcolm X, who though, you know, he preached the blue eyed white devil in the beginning. That's not where he, you know, was later in his life, you know, when, when he started to put together some different, you know, bits of information and see a bigger picture and un- come to understand that it wasn't, you know, like the success and survival of black people in this country depended on the success and survival of people in other communities around the world as well. And, that was huge. That was huge for all of us. It was huge for me. It was huge for the, the rest 
you know, for Michael and Andre and Rano and Henry and everybody that we came in contact with at that time. And then, you know, the, the, you know, the Reagan years followed by the Bush years <laughs> that, that was just, that was just low hanging fruit, you know, and, and like, like those guys were just repeatedly putting foot to mouth over, over, you know, some underhanded bullshit that was going on. And so everybody was talking about it, you know, it, 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 that's, that's everybody in punk rock and everybody in, in hip hop. And, you know, so it, it was just necessary. And, and it was, it was, like I said, it was low hanging fruit, you know, and then around that time, some of the information about COINTELPRO came, came forward and, and connected dots on the Black Panther Party and, the undermining of that and the undermining of, of, you know, as much as they tried to undermine, then they just started murdering people, but how they were undermining Malcolm and how they were undermining the Kennedy, the Kennedys and how they were undermining um, Martin Luther King just is nonstop. So, but we talked about that stuff and we felt it was necessary to share it. That was, it was that simple. It was just necessary to share it. That's, that's where we were at. And that was what, you know, was inspiring us to do what we, what we wanted and what we could do. It was what we could do. It it really, you know, it, it was just kind of a no brainer for us because, because that's, that's, that's what we were waist deep in. We were waist deep in all that stuff and it was necessary to get it out there. And, you know, I had a collection of, of Malcolm X speeches and Andre who was handling most of our like sampling stuff and playing like media back and he also was collecting stuff and finding things both sonically and visually you know there was a visual component with that as well you know there's sometimes where we were i was a couple of us were very influenced by this performance group in in the bay area called survival research laboratories and they you know were big on defacing some of the visual icons of of you know government leadership not just americans but but you know all the sort of corrupt dummies that were everywhere and so there were times where you know we were burning you know little uh eight by tens of of you know reagan or whomever you know uh in our in our live performances and so you know it was it was part of of there was a much bigger movement that was addressing that kind of stuff than there is now. And, and it was much more in your face. And that that's what we were trying to do. We were trying to be in your face. We were trying to make you feel safe with something that was very dangerous. <laughs> what did a friend of mine say? Slap you with a hug, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and the, you know, we were challenging people and we were all in our twenties. I love it. And it, that record is so influential and amazing. So thank you for talking about right on. the background on it too. Right on. Yeah, that it it was that for me too. You know, it was a glorious time for me to be around people like that. It, it was very inspiring. You know, Michael is a, a it is, and at that time, especially for me, he was able to articulate things that we all like. He would he would be able to take our hour long conversation you know, and distill it down to, you know, song form in three verses and, and, and a chorus. And that's hard to do. It's hard to do period. People that do that to me are, are, you know, that's, that's a true craft as they say, the gift of gab or whatever, but to be able to take, you know, that kind of emotional weight and and experience from from a circle of people and and then come back and make something that all of them go damn cool you know and it wasn't like well he took my words and put them into a song but you know he was able to take all that conversation and all that emotion and and the sharing and exchange of information and shape it into a thing and it was it was quite cool and then you know others of us where, you know, I, I can, I can take three notes and make a song out of it. You know, I can take a rhythm and build a thing, you know, like I can do that with sound. So it was a really nice marriage of, of talents 
coming together to make what what turned into that record. And we were very lucky to have someone come along and want to support us and help produce that record. And we were very lucky to have Jella Biafra come and see us and say, I want them on my label and get it out. Like all that stuff happened like clockwork in a way that rarely happens for, for bands, for any artists, writers, authors, you know, everybody goes through it. It's, it's a matter of a person walking into your, your studio and seeing your paintings and going, cool, I want these in my gallery. Then you get Basquiat, you, you know, the same kind of shit. And, and I'm grateful and, and feel lucky and blessed that, that those people also came along to support us. Billy Bragg, his manager saw us and said, maybe we should put these guys on before you and go tour in the States and, and, England uh, or and Canada, we toured Canada and they loved us and brought us over to over to Europe and all that stuff happened like clockwork. It was it was it was cool. And, That's a beautiful uh, alchemy. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. It it all was all of it. You know, from from Genesis. I mean, one of the more impactful things that I've ever seen in live performance was Michael simulated himself hanging at the little salon that I hosted and it, it brought tears to a room full of people, you know, in a way that, that I've rarely seen anybody. And he just, he was just holding the rope and just using his own body, you know, to, to make that happen. And it was crazy. It, it was, un, it, it was some otherworldly shit going on that he was channeling that made it seem real and was very, you know, made people very uncomfortable. Once in a while you get, you know, you get the right people in the room and some cool stuff comes out, you know, and that was yeah. one of them. That was definitely one of them. Oh, well, thank you for sharing that. I really appreciate it. Uh, I, I really like the movie eight and a half by Fellini. And yeah. I was wondering if you could talk about your your amazing group, the Brown Fellinis, and how right you on. use jazz and surrealism and, and what you're doing now with this group. So, you know, again, much like uh a lot of the information with with the beat with the beat nigs, and I think it happens more with certain circles that I've been in, uh, with bands than others. You know, it came out of a lot of conversation about how we wanted to do things and what we wanted to sound like and what we wanted to share with people and what we sort of value uh, as artists. You know, we were talking about surrealism and we were talking about the Harlem Renaissance and we were talking about people like Basquiat and, and Romare Bearden and, and films and, and our sax player, David, David Boyce was like, like Fellini's, but Brown. You know, and and or like Fellini, the filmmaker, you know, and in his approach at, of telling stories in in a more kind of just not not what's the word, just not just so plain and regular and everyday and you know hallmark kind of storytelling, but kind of making you sort of think after you watch this film, kind of like what the hell was he getting at? I got part of that. And let me think some more on it. And and maybe you have to talk about it with whomever you watch the film with and sort of arrive at a place that maybe you missed a few things. And but now through that dialogue or through just further digging in yourself of like, well, what did he mean by that? You know, what did that character mean when they they said that thing or what did what was he trying to say with this visual image? Because. That's the other part of it. And especially if you're not Italian or if you don't read Italian, you know, in subtitles, you kind of have to do that, you know, and just have to think a little deeper. So that those were kind of some of the things that we were sort of trying to address in, in what we wanted to make. What do we, what do we want to say with, with sound? And one of the things was, you know, we want to, we want you to think a little deeper. And so, you know, and when David said the Brown Fellinis, I was just like, that's great. That's cool. Because it also, you know, some of, uh, I can't think of right now his other film that is, uh, about a circus, 
but you know the flying Fellini brothers you know it just has a sense of humor to it that I felt also it, it also addressed and then another this great poet Jack Hirschman came up to us one night and he was like you know it also reminded him like the brown Fellinis reminded him of the brown shirts of 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 wartime back in I don't know first or second world war I don't I don't yeah. know that history that well but He's like, yeah, it's like the brown shirts. And we're like, oh, shit, you know, and it just I I like names uh, that that evoke, you know, those kinds of things and have multiple layers to them. And so, you know, it it offered up that that sort of perspective. And I was just like, OK, this is great. And then later we changed to further add to the sort of surreal our own surreal world. We changed from using a W to a U which causes a lot of people to want to be, you know, is that German or what? Brun Fellinis? And it's just like brown like sound. And then to, to speak to this sort of surrealism that, that we celebrate amongst ourselves and, and with our listeners and anybody reading words or anything that we share, part of, part of that surrealism arises out of coping coping in a society that that otherizes us on many levels uh both as as black men as black men in this society as as musicians artists in this society yeah it's a coping mechanism <laughs> it's how i handle you know walking through th- through this this plane but it also uh, allows us to connect with, you know, our our Africanness and our disconnected Africanness. You know, I can't tell you what part of the, you know, continent I come from, what tribe or group or culture. I can't tell you that, and most Black people in this country can't tell you that in the way that lots of other people, most other people, can tell you that. You know, they're Filipino and they come from, you know, their people go back to this part of the Philippines or they're Irish, you know, or they're Italian. And, you know, or the, and even more specifically, you know, the north of Italy or most most folks that look like me can't tell you that in this country. We have a place that we are very connected to called Buhabia that floats somewhere off the coast of Madagascar and you know it's constantly changing it has temples it has universities that weren't burnt down by Europeans it has you know safe havens for women it has it has oases that haven't been polluted it has animals that are friendly though if you mistreat them you know it can go bad for you very quickly Clyde the Sprinting Hippo uh, is our sort of spirit mother, and hippos are known to be some of the most dangerous animals to humans in Africa. And so, you know, we have a lot of parallels that that we pull from, but because none of us have been, none of us can confirm, you know, this is another way of having something that is ours in a way that we don't in in some other ways being who we are and where we are so and and it's beautiful because because we control that we own it we celebrate it we invite other people into it we tell our stories through it and it allows us to experience something that that some other folks really don't experience because they don't know that they can you know, a lot of folks don't know that they can, can cre- that they can create these kinds of worlds for themselves unless they, you know, get high. But, you know, that leads to a whole set of other <laughs> situations that yeah. maybe aren't so constructive. It's a very constructive way for us to, you know, exist. And and um, and for other people that get it, you know, for them to exist within it with us. Not all the Buhabians are black. Not all the Buhabians are males. Not all the Buhabians are straight, you know, heterosexual. But there are a lot of people that I call Buhabs 
because they understand and feel some things in ways that we do and and relate to and they express it that's beautiful i love it thank right you on. for sharing it word um my next question was about the your work with the stanford jazz camp if you could talk about that yeah i'm i'm leaving for that on uh wednesday oh, uh yes. so it's stanford the stanford jazz workshop is now in like year 51, two or somewhere around there. And it's a, uh, it's a summer camp mostly for kids, but there is uh, an adult component as well. I'm on the production staff for it. It's kind of a working vacation in a way for me to have some very focused time on music in particular jazz, but I also, you know, bring my laptop and a controller and have a small setup in my dorm room where I stay for a month and can work on consolidated stuff and Brown Fellini stuff and headbolt stuff as well. I'm on the production staff. I'm basically a glorified roadie on one hand. I'm the drum tech and uh, run a camp. One week is a commuter camp, uh, mostly local kids in the, in the Stanford Palo Alto sort of area, Bay area. And that's uh commuter camp is, is a nine to five camp the first week. And they do a recital at the end of the week. And then two weeks of sleepover camp with uh, 12 to 18 year olds and they sleep over, they stay on campus and some kids commute, you know, from, from surrounding areas, somewhere around 300 kids are on hand. And then the fourth week, so that's two weeks and the fourth week is uh an adult camp so sleepover and all those there's a recital at the end of the week the kids are in combos part of the time they learn they have a specific focus on an instrument so there might be a room full of trumpet players with a with an instructor another room of drummers and so on and so forth and they break out and they have theory classes as well it's a very intense week or two or three for some of the kids to learn about music and in particular jazz. It's, you know, it, it does have a very specific focus though. It's not locked into that and heavyweights come from all over the world to perform and instruct there. So, you know, there are people like Patrice Russian and George Cables and Esperanza Spalding and Herbie Hancock and, you know, some folks uh, participate more than others, but but it's cool. And one of the cool things for me is I, you know, I get to be a fly on the wall and and, and get some free music lessons. It's, just, you know, quite cool and have my mind blown by young people and be reminded that, you know, not all their music sucks. You know, it's it's cool to to hear young people playing jazz or playing jazz with a ukulele at the same time they're listening to drum and bass and they're, you know, writing jazz with drum and bass and they're blurring the lines and I love it. Music is music. It's a, it's a very cool experience to watch and listen to engage with some heavyweights in a way that I wouldn't otherwise to hang with a crew you know, there's several of us that have been doing this gig for like a decade or more. Through that, I've made good friends that, you know, I see once a year for a month. That's cool. That's awesome. They're lucky to have you too. So thanks for sharing that. Right on. Then my last question, it was like, what projects are you working on currently or what do you have in the in the works? Too much. <laughs> too much. I'm I'm actually, you know, using this time to to kind of pull away from some things because I literally have just been, I just started kind of gigging a lot around here in Madison, which means a lot of study, listening to tunes and, and all that. And some of it's cool. Some of it's kind of lame, but pays well. And, and some of it just is a waste of time. I'm kind of, you know, getting out of some of that stuff, but the consolidated stuff, you know, just we're, we're still plowing through, we recorded for five days. Three of those days were like eight to 10 hour days. Two of those wow. days were like five hour days. And that was just nonstop recording. Stop, eat a burrito, record some more, go home, rinse, repeat. 
Like that's what that was. So I, I can't tell you there, there many, many gigabytes of, of music got recorded in that session. So, you know, we're going to be plowing through this stuff for a while. I think, you know, I'm going to suggest we stop for a while and kind of refocus on finishing something that, you know, we can turn loose on people. Not quite there yet, but I think we're getting to having, you know, an album's worth of material that, you know, everybody can be happy with. And then with Brown and with Brown Fellini's, I'm again, I'm mining 30 years of, of live recordings and, and finding things. And uh, I'm getting ready to go back to California to play while I'm at jazz camp, do some shows with them. I also play in an all black, uh, Susie and the Banshees tribute band called Voodoo Dolly. Oh yeah. Uh And so we're going to do some, we're going to do one show, uh, while I'm there, you know, trying to get more Fellini stuff done. We just started, we, we, we just started working on a documentary in true form. We just decided to produce it ourselves because we just feel like we can tell our own story better than anybody. And we don't really want to make the typical rock and roll doc and just have this like, you know, kind of by the numbers, sort of what's your favorite color and, you know, that kind of shit. We just kind of want to approach it a little differently and, nice. you know, just very inspired by some other things like, like, and I'll just name some of the quick, easy ones for me, David, our sax player, who is much more, uh, I, I'm really pushing for him to be the producer and director of, of this whole thing. Cause I just think we'll make something that'll go a lot deeper than just, you know, your typical rock and roll doc about a band. But, um, you know, it's just influenced by like that, that if you haven't seen sympathy for the devil, that, that film about the Rolling Stones, you should see it. It's dope and has some crazy shit in it. And I can't call the guy who made it, but like a pretty heavyweight uh, filmmaker made that doc. And then if you haven't ever seen a soft self portrait about Salvador Dali made by Orson Welles. That's another one. Like oh, it's, yeah. you know, it's brilliant. And, but it's, 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 you know, again, it's just not your, your average, you know, doc about an artist. It's, it's Salvador Dali basically directing his own production of himself. <laughs> it's mm-hmm. awesome. And, and so, you know, stuff like that, that sort of stimulates us to kind of, do something a little bit more like uh, while they were here uh, at the beginning of last month, I shot a bunch of stuff on a green screen and I want to superimpose some backgrounds on it, you know, and put us in Buhabia where, you know, to give that a little bit more weight. And it's been something that, you know, we've always been the Brown Fellini's Brown part and sonically and live but we've rarely ever been the Fellini part of us that is visual. That is something that I really want to explore. And knowing, knowing us, you know, we'll just come up with some, some other stuff to, you know, further enhance uh, who we are and, and what we're trying to do and say, trying to sort of build that stuff out. And then also uh, I have a project that, is kind of in the, I need to write, I need to find money for it. I need like grant money to produce it, but it's kind of getting back to my more industrial side. Uh, and that is, hopefully I'm going to be rolling that out next summer. But like I said, I got to find money for it first, but that's going to be kind of a multidisciplinary, multidiscipline performance with dance and costume and industrial percussion. Nice. Yeah, that has no name or anything at this point, and uh, it's mostly notes. I I did do some field recordings with the artist that I'm. He's a metal sculptor that that kind of put me on to this project, and I've done some stuff at his compound uh, that I need to kind of assemble. But that'll first be kind of my reel for it, for for like a better word, you know, to fundraise for here's what i want to do give me money so that's 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 a year or two out still hopefully not more hopefully like i said i can roll it out next summer but while i'm at camp i'm going to be working on that quite a lot 
Nice. Well, I can't wait for everything coming out and thanks for sharing those projects. Yeah. Yeah. It's a nice thing about camp because I have, you know, several hours in the end of my day where I can just be by myself and focus on things and in a way yeah. that being a dad and a husband and having a household and two cats and a dog make it a little bit challenging. Oh yeah. You know, fam comes first. So uh, yeah. that's well, well, Kevin, I just want to thank you for spending time with me. I, I'm, I've been very inspired by talking to you and just grateful to, that you shared time with me. So I'm worried for that, man. Yeah. Thank yeah. you for having me. Much appreciated. Cool. A black people should have deal with it. People from Jamaica, people from everywhere there should have deal with it. And then other people will know that it is true and deal with it too. Because it's something higher, 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 higher.
That was the song Historical Materialism, Africa into the Future, Headbolt Future Motherland Mix by Consolidated. Check out the links to Kevin's website and other bands in the show notes and please support his work. Thanks for supporting the podcast and please share it around. <laughs>